Episode 9. To the left of this paper sat another, which had been folded so that a story bearing the title Ministry Guarantees Student Safety was visible. Newly appointed Minister of Magic Rufus Scrimgower spoke today of the tough new measures taken by his ministry to ensure the safety of students returning to Hogwarts School of Witchcraft and Wizardry this autumn. For obvious reasons, the ministry will not be going into detail about its stringent new security plans, said the minister. Although an insider confirmed that measures include defensive spells and charms, a complex array of counter-curses, and a small task force of horrors dedicated solely to the protection of Hogwarts School. Most seem reassured by the new minister's tough stand on student safety, said Mrs. Augusta Longbottom. My grandson Neville, a good friend of Harry Potter's, incidentally, who fought the Death Eaters alongside him at the ministry in June, and... But the rest of the story was obscured by the large bird cage standing on top of it. Inside it was a magnificent snowy owl. Her amber eyes surveyed the room imperiously, her head swiveling occasionally to gaze at her snoring master. Once or twice she clicked her beak impatiently, but Harry was too deeply asleep to hear her. A large trunk stood in the very middle of the room. Its lid was open. It looked expectant. Yet it was almost empty, but for a residue of old underwear, sweets, empty ink bottles, and broken quills that coated the very bottom. Nearby, on the floor, lay a purple leaflet emblazoned with the words, Issued on behalf of the Ministry of Magic, protecting your home and family against dark forces. The wizarding community is currently under threat from an organization calling itself the Death Eaters. Observing the following simple security guidelines will help protect you, your family, and your home from attack. 1. You are advised not to leave the house alone. 2. Particular care should be taken during the hours of darkness. Wherever possible, arrange to complete journeys before night has fallen. 3. Review the security arrangements around your house, making sure that all family members are aware of emergency measures such as shield and disillusionment charms, and in the case of underage family members, side along apparition. 4. Agree on security questions with close friends and family so as to detect Death Eaters masquerading as others by use of the Polyjuice Potion. See page 2. 5. Should you feel that a family member, colleague, friend or neighbour is acting in a strange manner, contact the Magical Law Enforcement Squad at once. They may have been put under the Imperious Curse. See page 4. 6. Should the dark mark appear over any dwelling place or other building, do not enter, but contact the aura office immediately. 7. Unconfirmed sightings suggest that the Death Eaters may now be using Inferi. See page 10. Any sighting of an inferior or encounter with same should be reported to the Ministry immediately. Harry grunted in his sleep, and his face slid down the window an inch or so, making his glasses still more lopsided. But he did not wake up. An alarm clock, repaired by Harry several years ago, ticked loudly on the sill, showing one minute to eleven. Beside it, held in place by Harry's relaxed hand, was a piece of parchment covered in thin, slanting writing. Harry had read this letter so often since its arrival three days ago that, although it had been delivered in a tightly furled scroll, it now lay quite flat. Dear Harry, if it is convenient to you, I shall call at number four Privet Drive this coming Friday at 11 p.m. to escort you to the borough, where you have been invited to spend the remainder of your school holidays. If you are agreeable, I should also be glad of your assistance in a matter to which I hope to attend on the way to the borough. I shall explain this more fully when I see you. 
Kindly send your answer by return of this hour, hoping to see you this Friday. I am yours most sincerely, Albus Dumbledore. Though he already knew it by heart, Harry had been stealing glances at this missive every few minutes since seven o'clock that evening, when he had first taken up his position beside his bedroom window, which had a reasonable view of both ends of Privet Drive. He knew it was pointless to keep re-reading Dumbledore's words. Harry had sent back his yes with the delivering owl as requested, and all he could do now was wait. Either Dumbledore was going to come, or he was not. But Harry had not packed. It just seemed too good to be true that he was going to be rescued from the Dursleys after a mere fortnight of their company. He could not shrug off the feeling that something was going to go wrong. His reply to Dumbledore's letter might have gone astray. Dumbledore could be prevented from collecting him. The letter might turn out not to be from Dumbledore at all, but a trick or joke or trap. Harry had not been able to face packing and then being let down and having to unpack again. The only gesture he had made to the possibility of a journey was to shut his snowy owl, Hedwig, safely in her cage. The minute hand on the alarm clock reached the number 12, and at that precise moment, the street lamp outside the window went out. Harry awoke as though the sudden darkness were an alarm. Hastily straightening his glasses and unsticking his cheek from the glass, he pressed his nose against the window instead and squinted down at the pavement. A tall figure in a long, billowing cloak was walking up the garden path. Harry jumped up as though he had received an electric shock, knocked over his chair, and started snatching anything and everything within reach from the floor and throwing it into the trunk. Even as he lobbed a set of robes, two spell books, and a packet of crisps across the room, the doorbell rang. Downstairs in the living room, his Uncle Vernon shouted, Who the blazes is calling at this time of night? Harry froze with a brass telescope in one hand and a pair of trainers in the other. He had completely forgotten to warn the Dursleys that Dumbledore might be coming. Feeling both panicky and close to laughter, he clambered over the trunk and wrenched open his bedroom door in time to hear a deep voice say, Good evening. You must be Mr. Dursley. I dare say Harry has told you I would be coming for him. Harry ran down the stairs two at a time, coming to an abrupt halt several steps from the bottom, as long experience had taught him to remain out of arm's reach of his uncle whenever possible. There in the doorway stood a tall, thin man with waist-length silver hair and beard. Half-moon spectacles were perched on his crooked nose, and he was wearing a long black traveling cloak and a pointed hat. Vernon Dursley, whose mustache was quite as bushy as Dumbledore's, though black, and who was wearing a puce dressing gown, was staring at the visitor as though he could not believe his tiny eyes. Judging by your look of stunned disbelief, Harry did not warn you that I was coming, said Dumbledore pleasantly. However, let us assume that you have invited me warmly into your house. It is unwise to linger over long on doorsteps in these troubled times. He stepped smartly over the threshold and closed the front door behind him. It is a long time since my last visit, said Dumbledore, peering down his crooked nose at Uncle Vernon. I must say your agapanthus are flourishing. Vernon Dursley said nothing at all. Harry did not doubt that speech would return to him, and soon the vein pulsing in his uncle's temple was reaching danger point. But something about Dumbledore seemed to have robbed him temporarily of breath. It might have been the blatant wizardishness of his appearance, 
but it might, too, have been that even Uncle Vernon could sense that here was a man whom it would be very difficult to bully.